Okay, so, so um, today's presentation will be on chapter three, or uh, more precisely, the first half of the chapter three. The chapter three is called the thesis. Now, before we start, maybe a very short, short recap of what we were talking about last time. So uh, Primoz presented uh, Plessner's um, investigation of Cartesian, the Cartesian project, which is basically, if we oversimplify somewhat, uh, a project which uh, fundamentalizes the distinction between the inner and the outer. So this dual aspectivity, which will be of central importance uh, in today's presentation and discussion is here um, uh, being fundamentalized. So the split between inner and outer um, subject and object um, is um, um, somehow being uh, transformed into the foundational aspect of, of the metaphysics. Uh, Plessner uh, draws on Kant um, and Husserl and Dilthey. Uh, so on a Kantian tradition, as he understands it in a very broad sense of the term, to um, undermine this fundamental fundamentalization of the inner outer split. And instead, he uh, says that we need to um, elucidate it um, better so that so that he so he proposes not to simply shun the 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 um, dual aspectivity so these two separate aspects uh, in which a thing can be given but that we need to thematize it more properly and the approach that he takes um, as we've mentioned is uh, he draws on phenomenology and particularly hermeneutics as he understands it so uh, hermeneutics understood in a somewhat broader uh, sense uh, not only pertaining to language, but pertaining to all phenomena. So uh, understanding the significance, the meaning of phenomena. And um, he wants to go and capture life its in concreteness, in its concreteness. So um, that's the reason. And he thinks that the thematization of this distinction, inner outer, will be crucial in that regard. Um, because uh, as we will see, living phenomena for Plessner are precisely those phenomena that give, ourself, give uh, themselves to us uh, or give themselves to our intuition uh, in and through this dual uh, aspectivity. And um, just as um, this call uh, for greater concreteness has um, given rise to the project of philosophical anthropology, which said that instead of uh, theoretical uh, models of a human being, we need to capture uh, the human being as a concrete person, he would like to embed this into a broader framework um, of biologic, uh, philosophical biology, where we would have uh, a similar thematization or rethematization of life and nature. So um, going back to capture life and nature in their concreteness. So in, in this particular segment of the book, he covers, Lesnar covers two topics. One is, as already mentioned, the dual aspectivity. And uh, uh, what he does here is basically he provides a phenomenological and philosophical expli explication of uh, this particular phenomenon or, or notion. And uh, he then uh, presents um, an interesting debate between uh, Köhler and Drisch about the nature of life, which he will, which he will use then in the second part of this chapter to um, uh, develop his own position on, on uh, the nature of vitality, uh, the nature of life through the concept of border. Okay, so um, dual aspectivity as already mentioned, uh, refers to this distinction between inner and outer and the very first thing that he says about dual aspectivity is that there is a certain conceptual ambiguity surrounding uh, the questions about dual aspectivity. Why? Because when we talk about this distinction between inner and outer, we can refer to either the spatial aspects of a given thing, so a given perceived thing, 
or certain non-spatial aspects of a given perceived thing. So uh, I will say a bit more about this as we progress, but uh, um, for the time being, the way he presents the difference between these two categories is as follows. So the spatial aspect, so the, the, the dual aspectivity as manifesting itself in the spatial aspects stands for divergent aspects of a given thing, which however are not convertible. So they are convertible. So this means that for instance, if you have a jug, <laughs> you have an inside and an outside, but you can go from one to the other. So from the concave to the convex it, within the same space. So you just need to flip around one segment of the jug and you basically get you know, to the other. So the, the inner and the outer are still connected in the sense of that you can get from one to the other uh, it, within, within the, 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 the spatial domain. And the same holds true sense, say for instance, for a glove. So you can just flip it from the inside to the outside and they are basically part of the same spatial domain, okay? But then there are also uh, non-spatial aspects which are divergent, but are inconvertible. And this is something that he will focus on and I will say more about this. So you cannot get to them in the same way that you would, um, so you cannot, um, convert one into the other in the same way that you would a uh, certain spatial aspect. So it is not possible to perform these transformations in space um, where you would simply convert one to the other. And he says that this is extremely important because for instance, some people, uh, some, some intellectuals uh, and thinkers uh, such as Gustav Pechner um, try to basically defend some version of uh, dual aspect theory of body and mind where he where, where, they, where they where they drew on um, the idea that body and mind are basically two uh, different aspects of the same thing and usually when they would try to thematize this they would revert to spatial metaphors and this is very problematic so Plesner says that we have to be very careful here and he tries to uh, show why this is the case. In order for him to be able to make this distinction as clear as possible, he basically provides a pretty well-known phenomenological analysis of a perceived thing. So he tries to, so he um, invites us to, um, to um, provide a phenomenological investigation of, you know, how a perceived thing is given to us in intuition as an intuitive thing. And he says that every perceived thing is given as a unity of properties, which is organized around a core. Um, so the important thing is here that whenever I see a certain thing, I see it from a certain perspective, from a certain aspect. So whichever thing I see, I always see only a certain aspect of this particular thing uh, in, in the sense that this aspect is given to me um, directly, or he says, this is the real aspect of the thing that I'm given. But whenever I see a thing, I don't see just, you know, uh, this particular aspect, and I don't see a two-dimensional something, but I always also see in a certain sense, so in, in my intuition, what is given in my intuition uh, together with this particular aspect are also the... Uh, other aspects that I could see if I were to turn around this thing, and also a certain core that is somehow holding these different aspects together. So that's why I never <laughs> just see one particular aspect. I'd never see just one particular perspectival something of a thing, but I also see somehow in my intuition, the whole thing. So, and um, one way of, uh, phrasing this would be if I always see always uh, if I always see only one aspect in actuality I also virtually see other uh, uh, co-present um, aspects and the core of the thing um, and he says that that our perception is structured in such a way that um, it is basically aspectival or perspective so that a being is always given to me as a being from one side. 
And this is not something that is, you know, um, that would be an anomaly. This is basically a law of human perception, of lived perception. The other way of putting this is to say that each aspect or each phenomenal, phenomenal content or perspective um, tran transgresses into the thing and around the thing. So there's a transgradients of, uh, of a given aspect of a given phenomenal content into the thing. So into the sub substantive core of the thing um, and around the thing. So into the possible sides of the thing. So every perceived thing has a certain depth to it and a certain sidedness to it. So again, I don't only see one, one aspect, but I also am given in intuition a certain depth and a certain sided sidedness. And uh, Plessner says basically that Kant, Hegel, and Husserl have already kind of paved the way to this analysis, particularly Husserl is well known for, for analysis of this type. Um, here's a quote that basically summarizes uh, what I've just said. The first direction aims at the sub substantive, co substantive core of the thing, which is the depth of the thing. And the second direction aims at the possible other sides. So this refers to the sidedness of the thing. This double direction of the gaze belongs to the real image. So this is the real image is the, this particular aspect that I am given that I see directly. So in actuality, if it is to be perceived as a present thing, and it is only in this duality directed giving of the gaze that the spatial sensory phenomenon appears as a unity of sidedness organized around the core as a thing. So importantly, perceived thing uh, because of the transgradience of the phenomenal content of or phenomenal aspects is not merely a sum of the sensations as say the empiricist theories would have it. So the core that, so the depth of the thing that I'm given is not imminent or demonstra uh, demonstrable in phenomenon. So I, I can never get to it in the sense of, you know, I can, I can turn around thing as much as I want and slice it open and whatever. I will never get to the core in the sense of, I will never see it in, as one of the perspectives. I cannot capture it within one of uh, the sense data moments that present themselves to me, regardless of how much tinkering with the thing I do. So the perceived thing is not merely a sum of its sensations, nor is it merely a construct, an intellectual construct, a product of intellectual sy synthesis, as for instance, you know, the hardcore Kantian analysis would have it. So it's not merely a, pro uh, a, a, a construct of the subject. The core, the depth of the thing, is not something, as Plessner puts it, which is external or detached from the phenomenon. So it's not something that is externally imposed on the phenomenon from the subject. It is something that is given already in the thing itself. So it's not like I just see different sense data and then my intellect somehow synthesizes this into a thing with a depth. No, that's a wrong way of proceeding or, 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 or understanding the, the, the lift the structure of the lived experience. Now, a very important thing that Plessner does is he says that depth and sidedness, so this particular uh, two um, dimensions that we've just portrayed should not be equated with spe spatiality. So these are not spatial characteristics. Why? Because he says, and this is very interesting, so he provides several reasons, but one of the reasons that is probably the most, the, the easiest to explain is that you also find this particular structure of a phenomenon, of a thing that is given, this depth sidedness structure in non-spatial reality of psychic life. He says that, for instance, will, feeling, thought are more than the sides that they turn towards consciousness. So whenever you have a certain thought, you know, uh, it is always given in a very specific aspect. So it has a specific expectival dimension, but there is also a horizon of this thought that is co-given and you can discover it by toying around with the thought. And you can also investigate this particular thought and try to get to the bottom of it. So you try to get to the core of the thought. You always have the impression that what is given to the consciousness when you're thinking something is not 
it, it does not completely exhaust the thought that you are um, uh, thinking at that particular moment. Um, and he says that whenever we use spatial images for thought, feeling, and, and so on and so forth, these only have metaphorical value. So if we try to spatialize you know, uh, uh, our language uh, about thoughts and feelings, this can only be metaphorical. Uh, so when we talk about, say, the depth or the core of a certain thought or other aspects or sides of a given thought or a feeling, then we are basically referring to something that is non-spatial. And one of the important consequences, one that Dan will be thrilled to hear about, is that for this reason, <laughs> Plessner feels that you know scientific explanation, scientific uh, investigation is inadequate. So he says that just as the naive approach of breaking open a thing in order to get at its insight as that which it truly is, is in its tendency a model for the elementary analysis of, of atomization in the natural sciences, the, scien the scientist employing the exact method, so the method of calculation, necessarily fails to capture substantiality. So if you try to somehow explain this dual aspectivity, uh, this depth sidedness structure of a thing uh, by simply trying to, you know, um, atomize it to put it apart or, you know, to, to reduce it to smaller chunks, this will not do because this kind of misses precisely this fundamental phenomenon that you're presented with, where you cannot so in, you cannot in principle achieve this it is equally naive as if you thought that by trying to um breaking to but by, by trying to break up a certain thing that you will get to its core um in, in the sense that we've just described now <clears throat> Plessner makes an important distinction here uh, which will be very important uh, particularly important for the second part of this chapter namely he says that um, in physical things, so what is characteristic of physical thing is that they appear by virtue of the dual aspect. In German, this is Kraft des Doppelaspekts. This means that whenever we see a physical thing, like a material physical thing, the spatial and non-spatial aspects, which, I, which we just covered, uh, can be separated only in reflection. So in intuition, they are basically somehow, you know, um, in, interwoven into one um, <laughs> meshwork. So you, you, the, the Plessner says that um, intuition is always somehow tricked into having the impression that, but yeah, but surely, you know, you can kind of uh, grasp the core and other sides by, by turning the thing around. So um, this distinction between the spatial aspects and non-spatial aspects, aspects, which is crucial, is um, given, again, only in reflection, but not in intuition. Living things, on the other hand, appear in the dual aspect, so im doppelaspect in German. That is to say, they present themselves to us in intuition in such a way that the spatial and non-spatial aspects are separate there already so the dual aspectivity is a mode is 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 a um is a specific mode of appearance of the living things of, of uh, vital things so living things are objects where the divergence of the sphere spheres determining the object itself becomes the object of intuition so this divergence so this dual aspectivity becomes the object of intuition. It is not only something that you, you know, uh, get to by in reflection, through reflection, but something that is already given to you in appearance. Okay, now the second topic that um, Plessner covers in this um, uh, first part, in the first half of the of this chapter, is the um, dispute between uh, these two intense looking gentlemen, namely Wolfgang Köhler and Hans Driesch. Um, 
Plessner refers particularly to two texts by this uh, by these um, two thinkers, uh, namely some Gest some Gestalt problems by Köhler and physische Gestalten und Organismen by Driesch. However, he also refers or at least alludes to certain other texts that I will be mentioning. So what's the deal here? Okay, so basically this dispute between Köhler and Driesch is a renewed version of a mechanism vitalism dispute that has been going on in uh, life sciences for quite some time. And if we want to understand the dispute between Köhler and Driesch, we have to very briefly first um, 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 acquaint ourselves with the traditional mechanism vitalism dispute. So this is the way Plessner presents it. Um, the traditional mechanism vitalism dispute is framed in the following way. Namely, um, the overall context um, in which this dispute was, play, was being played out presupposes the following that the understanding of a certain natural phenomenon is equal to providing a causal explanation of this phenomenon. So if you want to understand a certain natural phenomenon, you need to provide a causal explanation of this phenomenon. If then you want to understand a certain biological phenomenon, this means that you need to provide a causal explanation for this biological phenomenon, which means concretely that you need to provide that you need to reduce it to the physical chemical relationship relationships and the laws that hold between these physical chemical relationships and these laws and relationships are modeled on mechanical relations between isolated particles okay and then biological phenomena in this framework are basically natural phenomena with a certain surpl surplus of vitality which is identifiable by a number of specific properties. So living beings have are basically physical phenomena with a certain surplus of vitality. And this vitality is given through certain specific characteristics such as growth, metabolism, reproduction, and so on and so forth. Now, mechanist and vitalist approaches differ in that Mechanist approaches will, will understand this surplus of vitality as something that can be reduced to physical chemical factors, whereas the vitalist approaches will simply deny this. So they will uh, insist that a certain additional factor, a certain additional life principle is required to account for the organization of uh, vital phenomena for these properties that are characteristic of them. However, both of them basically um, uh, accept this idea that natural phenomena are machine-like. And by machine-like, I mean like that typical old school aggregate conception of machines. Now, why Kuller is important is um, because, um, so he is one of the most important um, um, representatives of Gestalt psychology. And what Gestalt psychologists did was that they um, basically um, ruffled quite, quite a few feathers in, in the scientific psychology, uh, in the field of scientific psychology. And some of the findings or reflections of Gestalt psychologists um, uh, were also useful for this particular debate. So Plessner, this is the reason why Plessner claims that uh, Köhler basically brought new life into the question of vitalism versus me mechanism. So what's the deal? According to Gestalt psychologists in general, um, when we are confronted with perceptual entities, with perceptual phenomena, what we are given are certain unities and not merely aggregates of sense, a, sense data. So one of the biggest contributions of Gestalt psychologists is this idea that um, perceptual phenomena are not conglomerates of sensations. They are not summative su structures. So you cannot simply put uh, you know, uh, specific segments, um, specific individual sense data together, and then you get a whole 
that presents itself to you in, in perception, but they are gestalt. That is to say, they are unified structures which have their own um, qualitative um, um, characteristic that is different from a mere sum of, of, uh, uh, of um, their constituent sense data. Um, Lesnar provides an example here. He provides the example of a drawn figure. So you draw a finger, figure and then you color it. And the thing is that once you color it, what happens is you are witnessing a qualitative shift. So the whole figure changes. It's not like you, know, you simply have added new elements and then the whole is simply a sum of the figure that was there before the coloring and after the added colors. But the colored figure itself is basically becomes a new whole in light of which its previous constituent segments change. So they acquire a different, different significance, a different uh, structure and orientation. And the question that emerges here is whether this type of analysis or investigation could be useful for other disciplines, particularly life sciences. And in a book, um, uh, a not particularly well-known book, but a very interesting one, Die Physischen Gestalten in Ruhe und im stationären Zustand, eine philosophische Untersuchung. Wolfgang Köhler basically um, provides, um, so he defends the idea that you find Gestalt structures already in the realm of physics. And not, they are not like some, that this is not true only of certain very, rare instances or very specific cases, but that they are omnipresent, so to speak. And he provides many uh, ex uh, examples of electrical and chemical processes that basically behave in, in a gestalt-like manner. Uh, he talks, for instance, about uh, the way that the uh, electrical, uh, electrical charge gets distributed in um, uh, um, specific um, apparatuses, uh, how the chemical balance gets restored during chemical reactions, how the, 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 the water droplet um, constitutes its shape or form uh, given specific circumstances. And he says that all these examples are basically examples that where these unities are um, here, <laughs> these holes are basically more than just summations. So they are not just agglomerates, but they actually constitute uh, novel structures, novel gestalten. Why? Because if a certain segment of, you know, of, um, um, of this structure or of this unity changes, then the whole conf the, the, the configuration of the whole structure is modified. So the, these unities basically um, operate as holes, which then somehow um, determine how an individual change within that hole will manifest itself in all the other segments. So you, you, we are not here witnessing uh, individual discrete elements, but basically aspects of a whole. And he says that, you know, if we can find these unities, these Gestalten at at the level of physics, there's no reason why we couldn't apply this to vital phenomena. And he basically says, if we look at biological uh, phenomena, they, um, they behave in, in, very, in this particular Gestalt-like fashion. And then Driesch, the, the famous or infamous uh, neo-vitalist, he says that uh, all this is nice and well, but that uh, uh, Kühler is uh, basically missing a very important point. And Dries draws a, an, an important conceptual distinction between unity, that is to say Einheit, and wholeness, Ganzheit. So he says that unities are basically Gestalt phenomena, and he agrees, sure, you can find these phenomena at the level of physics. However, there is a problem. These unities, according to Dries, are still only unities of effect. So this means that According to him, they are still aggregates. You can still understand them as summative holes, which means that if you know the parts of these holes and the dynamic poten potencies of these holes, you are able to uh, account for the unities, the holes themselves. And also, even though these holes usually 
so that, that they transform um, as holes. So that means that basically that if a given segment of a hole changes, then the whole structure will be modified or restructured. That's true. But Drish says that they always do so within a very rigid topography. So there is a very fixed, there are very fixed peripheral values within which this can happen. And these peripheral values, so these are basically the circumstances in, in, in which this can happen, are something that is pre-given and is very rigid. And it's something that the whole or this unit itself cannot modify. On the other hand, you have wholeness, which is uh, something that you find on the level of biological phenomena. And this wholeness is something that is more than simply Gestalt phenomena. Why? Precisely because it has something that the physical Gestalt lack. And what is this? The capacity to reconstitute the peripheral values. So these peripheral values that determine how physical Gestalt will change, biological unities or holes not only are able to do these um, wholesale transformations that you find in physical gestalten, but they can also change the parameters in which they will undergo specific modifications. So no, not only can they restructure and modify themselves in unison, but they can also modify the, their own conditions of possibility to a certain degree. So there is no underlying rigid topography to biological phenomena, but there is a qualitatively different flexibility that cannot be found on the, on the physical level. And Drish here refers to autergy. I'm not sure whether I'm pro pronouncing this correctly, but this is basically a term for self-action. So the capacity of living phenomena to act on themselves, this would be something similar probably to the idea of autopoiesis or something like that, this recursive action on living beings where they can change their own uh, topography, so to speak, and thereby um, um, extend the, the, the possible modifications that they can undergo. And according to Driesch, this cannot be accounted for by any physical means or by any means that are accessible to uh, natural sciences. And then he introduces the notion of entelechy, which operates into the space rather being enclosed in it. So it is somehow um, 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 put outside of space and time. And it is something that, uh, that can um, organize specific segments of space and time. Now, why is this debate important? because it brings the two camps, so the vitalist and mechanist camp closer together. So for the neo-mechanist, uh, a mechanical expla explanation must no longer simply adhere to the model of the sum of particles, but can also follow the model of the Gestalt, an effective unity as a transposable totality of form. So after Köhler and several other, other authors, mechanists have at their disposal a different conception of a machine. So the notion of the machine undergoes a change and they can, um, they can uh, insist on mechanical accounts without necessarily being forced to adopt these summative uh, uh, accounts uh, that were characteristic of the 18th and the 19th century uh, uh, mechanical um, approaches and schools. For the vitalist, on the other hand, the uniqueness of living conditions and processes has been reduced to the autergy and autonomy of their gestalt systems by virtue of which they come to constitute holes with a spontaneous impetus. And the bone of contention in this dispute suddenly becomes gestalt nature, namely the question whether wholeness that you find in uh, living beings can be accounted for by uh, gestalt phenomena, or there is something in uh, in, in biological phenomena, which Driesch uh, refers to as uh, biological holes, that somehow uh, transcends the, the, uh, the, the mere gestalt, the, the mere physical gestalt uh, domain. 
the way Plessner will proceed is he will basically try to um, propose some sort of a via media. Namely, he will um, agree with Driesch against Köhler that there is an essential difference between the inorganic Gestalt and organic wholeness. So you will remember that Driesch was one of Plessner's uh, mentors. So he will be defending his mentor in this regard. However, he agrees with Köhler and in this regard opposes Driesch that this does not give rise to vitalism. So we do not have to take recourse to vitalist philosophy uh, if we want to insist there, that there is such an essential dis difference between Gestalt and wholeness. And um, in the second part of the, of the chapter, he will basically try to uh, investigate how his analysis or his investigation of dual aspectivity uh, relates to the notion of Gestalt. And he will basically try to defend the idea of the essential difference between Gestalt and wholeness by a very specific, unique uh, thematization or um, um, uh, explication of the notion and phenomenon of border. So this is it. This is the presentation. And now moving on to the discussion. <laughs> Anyone, any questions, comments? Yeah, Philip. Yes, uh, one of the things that's always struck me the, 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 that he that it seems Plessner is reaching beyond Driesch in this is that Driesch really doesn't seem to distinguish between a concept of substance and simply a concept of matter. And so we get a notion of matter is accepted in uh, the kind of terms of which had been defined in the science of his time. And then we add to this or try to uh, effectively make work in this, uh, this concept of entelechy. And I, I think his concept of entelechy is more subtle at times than it's often presented. And I'm not saying you, you did that, but I think that what um, I've seen in Plessner is he's trying to get more at a reach somehow deeper, get beyond a conception of matter uh, to a conception of substance here. And uh, which aren't the same things. I think they're often conflated in the whole histories of these discussions of mechanism and vitalism. But I, I think that's a, that's a positive uh, insight that he seems to, to bring in. Let me ask just another question that it has struck me is that it seems that Plessner's analysis of uh, Kurler would apply pretty much to a lot of appeals to systems theory. Is, is, would this be a uh, perception of other people here that, that they that so much of the analysis discussion of systems theory is really raising similar kinds of periods there but that's a question i have but it seems to strike me and because we're getting a lot of times of systems theory discussions in in sort of non-reductive analyses of biology can i say yeah, something that, that that's a really good point uh Phil, because if you look at the initial appeals to system theory in biology, which tend to be traced to around the 1920s, and people like um, right, like Bertalan, but also um, you know Weiss and others, th there seems to be an attempt there also to not uh, identify as vitalistic any attempt to discuss living systems living, you know by organisms as systems so it's it's an attempt in a sense to naturalize the vitalistic intuition that there's something different between life and non-life but that we don't want to frame it in terms of entities that may appear to some as metaphysically offensive like the entelechy yeah. um and so you know in, in some sense you can really think of the whole organicist uh movement as an attempt really to to find a middle ground there in the same way that plesner is here 
Um, I myself have a little bit of an idiosyncratic interpretation uh, here because I actually think that the organicists can be unproblematically characterized as, as vitalist, as sort of naturalized vitalist in some sense, because they're, they're, they have in that sense more, more in common with the vitalists in what they're trying to do, even if their positive proposals are different, of course, because yeah. they don't want to make the mistakes of people like Greece, right? Um, and so that over, already opens up the, the interesting question of whether we can, you know, situate Plesner uh, alongside, I mean, philosophically alongside these other organicists. But going to your specific question about systems theory. So, so Bert Lanthi, right, who considers himself to be the sort of the founder of general systems theory, uh, moves towards that uh, interest from starting from biology, right? So he's initially interested in how biological systems exhibit systemic behaviors. He's interested in bringing physics to bear on how we understand certain biological properties, even, you know, comes up with new notions such as equifinality to explain this capacity of systems to end up, you know, to compensate against perturbations, basically to explain scientifically what people like Dries had noticed when they did these experiments, right, where, you know, the famous experiments with the sea urchins and the Stazione Zoologica in Naples. And, and so you got this move, right, already in the 20s of wanting to talk about steady states and talking about thermodynamics in a way that will enable us to make sense of what is distinctive about life uh, in, in physical terms. Um, so on the one hand, it would appear that um, that, though, that, it, that, with, that the system's view is similar to the Gestalt view, but on the other hand, I don't think that that necessarily works because I think that for people like Bert Lamphy, there, there is a, a, an attempt or a desire to want to to really distinguish these sorts of systems. I, you know, I think that you, it's not, he's not easily classified on the mechanist camp if we want to classify Kohler in that camp at all. Um, so it's a really good question to ask because it forces us to focus our attention on, on what it is that we are referring to when we talk about organisms and systems, right? We are trying to talk about them in a way that is more natu naturalistic and less metaphysically opaque, but are we trying to say that, that therefore we can understand uh, you know, that there are no differences. I mean, the other interesting question that comes from that is that general systems theory was precisely designed to try to suggest that not only living systems are systems, right? So again, yeah, something that seems to be similar, right? But I think that as far as Bert Lanfey is concerned, the other systems, that be, the other entities that can be considered systems are always at higher levels of organization than organisms. Right, so he says, well, okay, a cell is a system, a multicellular organism is a system, and maybe perhaps also, um, you know, a youth social ant colony is a, is a system, or maybe a social organization is a system, or a human society is a system, but so it may go upwards in terms of level of organization, but I don't know if it goes back, you know, lower, below, right, to a level below the living. So, it's, so you know, all living system, all living, all systems are living, is that right? And not all living are systems. Uh, it, it, uh, is that is that what I'm saying? Also the other. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that you don't want to say anything at that the inorganic level. Okay, so uh, I don't know. If that's that is also your impression of of your general systems theory tries to do. But my impression is that it's like okay, the living is the is the most basic fundamental kind of system. And yes, there are other systems, but they have to be they have to start from the living. Whereas I guess the classic mechanistic approach is not to worry about that distinction at all and say you know you can you don't have to co concern yourself with the living organization at all uh, and for that reason we can't we don't have to worry about this ascent but there being an essential difference between the living and the non-living just 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 a footnote or just a follow-up on that then because if we can see plessner work as a kind of via media between these two positions and then it seems that he would still have a critique here of the kind of thing that Bertolanfi is is raising uh, in that as well. I mean, that the systems theory would still be, in some ways, more like the closer to the Gestalt than than certainly than the Vitalist. But I don't think I think it's different than what he's trying to do. I think he's trying to think something through more fundamentally in that, and that's particularly moving to the question of the inner and the outer that he developed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's good. Good. I'm glad to hear your comments on that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad that this uh, question has come up for discussion. Um, just uh, a few comments. I I don't know Bertolanthi and the early 20th century system um, people, but I 
I did look a little bit at the kind of contemporary debate about what is life. And one of the things that ends up happening is that people, people say things like, well, life is just exceptionally complex in comparison, you know, living systems are exceptionally complex, but that move immediately then, you know, offers the alternative, you know, offers the opening for people to say, well, look, they're really complex non-living systems too, right? And that kind of ends up looking like the Kohler, Kohler's defense, right? Um, and so people who want to defend something distinctive about life, you know, end up having to say something like, well, varela, autopoiesis, you know, it's, it, 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 life is something that directs its own course, that defines its own environment. Um, and there are a variety of other things that people, you know, point to. People point to evolvability or people point to metabolism. You know, I know Dan knows that, that kind of argument goes back to, um, to uh, Schrodinger, you know, the What is Life book. Yeah. Um, but uh, in any case, I do think Flesner is, is sort of stepping, he's trying to articulate a position that kind of steps outside of that entire framework of debate. Mm -hmm. And the way that I think he does it is by referring to the role of, of phenomenological intuition or the way that things appear to us or the way that we treat things. So there's a kind of reference to the observer in his account of what makes a living thing a living thing or what makes living things appear as they do. Um, and, and that move likely has its own problems, okay? But, um, but I, I, think, I think a useful reference point for that, and I'm not gonna go on and on, but a useful reference point for that is Kant, his idea of reflective judgment. Um, because I think, you know, and, and, and Driesch is sort of describing with the entelechy from, I think from Flesner's perspective, Driesch is describing important parts of how living things to appear to us in intuition. But Driesch understands what he's doing as something like simply ontic or, or ontological, he doesn't understand it as something phenomenological, as something about the way that things appear. And pretty soon, Plesner is going to use an example of a toy snake, if I remember incorrectly from the text, that the toy snake looks alive. You know, if you think about it, you move a snake, right? It looks a lot, you know, a, a rubber snake, right? It can look alive to us. What makes it look alive to us? When we study it more closely, we see, okay, we no longer perceive it as alive, you know, if we, if we look at it more closely. But when it looks alive, what makes it look alive? And Plesner thinks what makes living things look alive to us or seem alive to us is that they have an, in, an innerness, an inside that is not merely a spatial inside. We experience them as having a kind of, uh, I don't know what, I don't even know if the German is like in Ehrlichite, but that would be a good German, you know, articulation of it, an innerness, you know, and uh, I, again, I, I don't, I put it that baldly, I don't know if I'm convinced by it, but if you try to sort of feel your way into it, does that seem right to you? Does it seem right to you that when you see a tree or a, or a, a microbe or an animal that you experience it as having in some sense a kind of center from which it behaves, from which it operates, mm -hmm. that is not merely the spatial center of the thing. And part of the purpose of Plesner going into so much detail about substance and properties versus spatial inside and outside is to say that actually when we, when we think carefully, we see that non-living objects have that structure too. So it's a very deep phenomenological point about the difference between spatial inside and outside and something else, some other kind of kind of definitional or constitutive inside and outside. But there's also a, a, an intuitive phenomenological experiential difference in how we, uh, how we feel or experience living things in comparison with non-living things. And so, yeah, I'm, all, I'm, I'm in for the ride to see, you know, to remind myself to see again what he does um, with this point going forward. That's extremely helpful. That's really great. And it's making me wonder whether we could sort of map out the commitments of all these actors, right? So I was trying to do this, uh, I didn't do it very successfully in terms of a Venn diagram of some kind. Um, you know, so you have basically people who are committed to what you could call a sort of a naturalist standpoint or continuous with science. And there you would put, um, you know, the organicist as a, but you wouldn't put Plesner, right? Because Plesner's bringing that phenomenological account. Uh, you put Kohler, but you probably wouldn't put Drish in some sense, right? 
So that's one way to think about what the you know of dividing them up. And then another way would be whether you think right that there are, that there's an ontological distinctiveness to life or not, and that's like the classic mechanism vitalism distinction. So there you would put on the left right the organicists, so those who do think it, uh, organicists and Driesch and maybe Plessner, but not uh, uh, Kohler. Um, so yeah, it's it's it complicates the territory uh, because as you, it's very interesting what you say, Philip. So basically, he is in spirit trying to arrive at the same sort of conclusion as the organicist in wanting to go beyond Driesch and beyond vitalism and in, in, in and nevertheless justify the ontological distinctiveness of some kind between life and non-life. And yet he's doing it in, he's just not interested. He's like doing, coming from a completely different angle, like mm -hmm. from a philosophical angle. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in some sense, they are, have a lot of things in common and other things that in, in other respects, they're completely different. And in other respects, actually, the organisms have more in common with um, with a mechanist in the sense or with, uh, you know, someone like Kohler. So it's very interesting mm -hmm. to think of that way. Very good, good, good. Yeah, also the thing that, uh, just a very small addition to this, uh, what he's also trying to do, he, he's trying to find a way um, or an entry point that would allow him to show why, for instance, so, so um, a point of view that would show in what sense both Driesch and Kühler could be partially right, but why they're ultimately wrong. So as you will see, basically, he will claim something like Driesch is basically describing the the whole intuitive experience. So before I kind of fracture it into a very specific point of view, which is what Driesch does. So if I look at the whole structure that he's been trying, that he will try to present with this dual aspectivity, this is what Driesch, Driesch is trying to thematize a bit awkwardly, however. Uh, maybe a very small um, side note on Driesch here. Driesch was very big on Kant. So he was kind of, he understood himself to be um, in, in the tradition of Kant. And uh, he was aware that he was doing something that was so that when he was studying biological phenomena, that he was studying biological phenomena. But he had this impression that, you know, entelechy is something that is in the realm of the noumena somehow, and that certain other categories need to be introduced into the whole story. So in addition to say Kantian mechanic, mechanical causality, you also need say a, a holistic or organic causality, which is different. And this is something that Kant overlooked. So it, it, it's interesting because Driesch was also in a certain, so th this is why at the very beginning I was emphasizing why it's so important to understand this enormous um, uh, weight of, of the Kantian tradition on all these Germans. They were all operating in this in this thought style, so to speak. You know, Driesch in a certain sense, Plessner in another sense. But the the, the what what Plessner is trying to do is he's trying to, yeah, get rid of all these potentially problematic moves and really you know stick to the concreteness. So can I account for wholeness, of which Driesch is talking about? So which Drish, which Drish is referring to without necessarily having to reduce it to Gestalt and without necessarily having to go outside of the, of the domain of the concrete experience and refer, you know, refer to, to entities regardless of how one understands them as, you know, uh, uh, entelechy. So be it yeah. a process or some noumenal thing or whatever. Um, so he thinks that this is something that he can do so that, that he can find a story, a narrative where he will be able to show, well, you know, if you look at this point of reference, from one perspective, you get Driesch. If you look at it from other perspective, you get Kohler. But the problem is that they were both, you know, overtly narrow in their approach. And it's here I'm trying. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to say to you is that that's absolutely not original to Plesma. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Proposal for sure. is okay, but that is basically the. If you look at any book from, well, not any book. I don't want to generalize too much. But just, just to make my pronouncement a little bit more dramatic, I, I would say that yeah, if you look at any book in biological theory written, let's say between the two war, world wars, 
uh, you will often find that the, the structure of the discourse is, is exactly that. So you've got this traditional mechanistic view, which has been served us so well in the past, and it would be foolish to get rid of it. And you know, it's given us so much information, fine, but it's got its limitations. And so, but we don't want to throw away the, ba the baby uh, with the bathwater, right? So we want to keep certain things about that. On the other hand, you have this other tradition that's been so good at resisting heroically the reduction of life to machines and mechanics. And surely they have, you know, there's a lot of insight there that we want to keep, but we don't want to make the mistake of ending up with some sort of worldview or understanding that is, that is beyond the confines of what we would deem to be scientifically acceptable. And so here is right my proposal, and and that you see that again and again, and in, uh, in, you know the British authors, in the German-speaking authors, in the Americans, right? We're also writing about this in this time. So there's nothing new at all in that. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Plessner was inspired by what his because this is at the same time, right, 1920s, uh, by some of his contemporaries who were doing that. I mean, I think Adolf Meyer is mentioned, Meyer Abek, and he's someone who is really important here in also developing this Ganzite, this this holistic biology. And, he, and, he, and we know that he read John Scott Haldane and some of the British authors. He actually translated some of these English organicist treatises into German, which is kind of interesting, right? He was involved in doing that. He wrote to Needham, this nice correspondence between Adolf Meyer. So this super interesting, you've got, you got all this correspondence happening, right? There's awareness that there's a discourse, there's a community of authors who are trying to do exactly this, find a middle ground between these two positions that in some, as you said it, in some sense, go uh, recognizes this, the strengths of both, but is going beyond both, right? So there's, I don't think there's anything new in that, and that's fine because what I think is super interesting about Plessner is that he's doing that in a completely different way, as it were. Yeah, right? yeah, this is precisely what I want to say. So yeah, he, no, he's trying true. to open up a realm that he thinks is not being has not been explored yeah. with regards to this. You know, precisely this approach that Philip mentioned. Basically, you know, he thinks that this will be. Uh, domain of sorts that will uh, that will allow precisely for what many out authors are aspiring to achieve so what you've said yeah um, i'm going to try and answer philip's question by looking at some of my uh, i've got a couple of books actually which were written as surveys of biological theories in the 20s and 30s Two of them. I'm going to see if, if the guest out yeah. stuff comes up because that'd be quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Driesch is, uh, is obviously like the major reference point for the yeah. vitalist debates in the early 20th century. And a lot of people would just outright reject them or look for. But I wonder I wonder whether like the, is the Kohler Driesch debate a thing that's widely recognized? Yeah. And it might yeah. be. I, you know, yeah, so so two things to say about that. Well, 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 one is Driesch has this incredible ability to unite people against him. Right. So that if there's one thing that all the organicists have in common is that they all read him and all, uh, you know, think that he, he had the right intentions, but the completely wrong answers. Right. So that unites them against the mechanist camp. Um, and actually, to make the story a little bit more complicated, even the second wave of organicists, right, are, are united by wanting to go beyond the simplistic views of organicism of the first wave. So if you read Bert Lamphy, and uh, you compare it to reading Needham and Woodger, what you find is that they say, well, this guy, John Scott Haldane, too simple, too simple, too, it's like very obscure. We need to go beyond and, and they all actually write about how they disagree with him, even though they're extremely inspired by him. So even within the organicist movement itself, uh, you can find these sort of people coming together in their desire to reject, right? A particular view. But I think Drish, as you put it, right? He's always there. Uh, he's always there because, you know, he was a respected figure. In, in the sciences, unlike, um, I mean, Bergson, there's been a revival of interest now in Bergson and philosophy of biology and all that, but Bergson doesn't come up as much because he, he's, he's seen as an outsider, right? Whereas Driesch is not an outsider. Driesch is someone who has come to his own conclusions by doing good old solid experimental work that demonstrated the problems with the mosaic theory of development and other ideas that, you know, that were prevalent at the time, right? Is uh, the, 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 uh, um, the mechanic and all that stuff, right? Uh, so, so that's something to bear in mind that Drish is always going to come up, right? But I actually found just by a very cursory look that there is a whole chapter on Gestalt theory. This is a book called The Riddle of Life. It's from 1936. It's basically a review of theories of life, okay, uh, by written by William McDougall. And there's, I, I haven't read this chapter, but it's um, it, it actually this section called The Gestalt Theory Brings New Hope to the Mechanists. Uh, call a search for a regulative physical principle which may explain the teleological processes of organisms. So this suggests to me 
that even if you know Plessis' book was not translated into English, this is a, a British author, there was a, a realization at the time that Gestalt theory could provide a new life to the mechanistic sort of approach and that it didn't necessarily have to rely only on people like Loeb, one of these sort of hard-lined mm -hmm. mechanists who were completely committed to this physical chemical reduction of you know, biology as physics. Um, so yeah, that, that would seem to me my, my preliminary answer to your question that yes, it was there even in the English speaking. Uh, Plus, you know, both Kuller and for instance, Kofka, the second big figure in, in uh, the Gestalt psychologist original trio, they both moved to, to the States. So they were both uh, very active there. And, um, um, and uh, so, so some of these ideas have definitely, because they, they were also quite active with regards to publishing in, in English. So these ideas probably became more widely known. And yeah, what uh, Susanna is mentioning in the in the chat, um, th this is precisely what, what I found so interesting the first time I read uh, Plessner, that uh, the critique uh, that he provides is very close to the one that is given in the structure of behavior by Merleau-Ponty. Um, they are basically criticizing um, Gestalt psychologist from a very similar perspective. So that in a certain sense, the Merleau-Ponty, what he says is that um, psych uh, Gestalt psychologists are have failed to adhere to the implications of their own uh, revolution. So to, to adhere to the implications of their own uh, alteration of how to perceive, say, you know, psychology, biology, sciences in general. So in the structure of behavior, he's trying to develop Gestalt philosophy from, from Gestalt psychology. And he provides a very similar critique so that you, 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 you simply have great difficulties defending a physicalist position if you, if you are a gestaltist of any sort, you cannot simply insert gestalt structures into the physical realm and then say, well, everything is reducible to that. Because if gestalt is the crucial ontological segment that you start from, then the material differences are no longer essential, but differences in organization, in structure, in gestalt are crucial. So this is why he says, for instance, that biological gestalt and physical gestalt cannot be simply, you know, identified. So he has an answer to the question that you were posing before then. So, you know, for instance, uh, Merleau-Ponty would, 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 would argue that um, biological and um, uh, physical gestalt are different because they are different types of gestalt. They are different types of structuration. So even though, even if you have gestalt of sorts on, on, the, on the physical level, on the biological level, you will find different gestalt, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not it's not a it's not a problem, so to speak. Yeah, this this sorry to refer back to Philip's question, but it, the, this chapter is is all about uh, gestalt, uh, Philip. So it's uh, basically it's being discussed a bit like Plessner is uh, as a way of as a, you know I'm discussing color particularly, right? The 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 why it's important in, in a showing that non-living systems can also uh, exhibit regulation of a sort, right? And the question, does regulation occur then in the inorganic systems and, and all of that? So yes, the, that was definitely part of the conversation at the time. Again, not something that unique, unique to Plessner. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a much more we could say about the articulation of, yeah, I will also shut up and maybe later uh, ask more questions. No, 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 man, go on, go on. This no, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to see if anyone else wants to. I, I, I wanted to say that we could perhaps also discuss how Plessner frames the mechanism vital in dispute with, with these premises. Seemed a little bit idiosyncratic to me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, maybe we can talk about that later. So any comments on that? Any, uh, any other questions? So that we don't have a trio discussion here, basically.
Yeah, Susanna, go on. Question that may take us out of this interesting debate, but uh, I take Plesner's view in this chapter as defending a kind of direct realism, but I'm not sure. Like he talks about like sense eta, um, but he like denies that and criticizes that. And he goes also to Gestalt, but um, I don't know. Does I don't know if he thinks that it is the object that we perceive, like directly, through the different aspects. Like this um, substance is like directly given through the aspects, or if he's like also referring to some like intermediate, like sensata, but like in the form of Gestalt. Or uh, so I was not sure about that, but I don't know if it's like relevant <laughs> to the discussion. Any thoughts on this? <laughs> I I just want to say I think it's a really good question, and I don't I don't know how to answer it because I think there are aspects of what Pleasner is doing that where it seems like he's hinting at that, or he he doesn't want to shut the door on some kind of direct realism, but at the same time, there's a lot of what he's doing that seems to be really kind of staying with the level of intuition in terms of the analysis. So he doesn't, it's almost like he doesn't, he doesn't want to pull away. He's, it's almost like he's performed a sort of phenomenological reduction before he started the work right. of this chapter and he doesn't want to pull away from that framework. Um, but I think that, I do think it's important to him that what he says about the object, for instance, when he talks about, and there's one line that I marked that he says, an aspect is not just a subjective thing or aspects aren't, aspectivity is not just subjectivity. So I think he's careful. He doesn't want to do the intuition level analysis in a way that shuts the door on direct realism because after all, that wouldn't get the intuitions right because we have an experience of, of having, uh, interacting with real objects. And so I think, Ultimately, and this is just my own my own reading, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think all Pleasner scholars would say it this way, and I'll shut up after this, but this is my own reading, is that there's a defense of realism, of a kind of straightforward direct realism in Pleasner because of the impossibility of coherently holding any other position. I mean, all of the evidence of our intuition, all I should, shouldn't say evidence, I should say like, our experience of things, our way of being in the world as, as he later describes us eccentric beings, centric and eccentric beings, okay? Our way of being in the world involves ha having a realist view about what we're doing and what others are doing. And it just would be, it would be eccentric in a bad way. It would be so wild. It would push our, our, our way of thinking or interacting with the world so far out of what fits a coherent view of things for us not to think that that's what we're doing. Um, but I think Plesner also has to recognize the possibility of things like radical skeptical doubt and things like that, right? Humans can think that, they can pose those questions. But anyway, that, uh, I'm again, I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer it. And I also am, I am also repeatedly suspicious that I'm talking too much in this group. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Uh, one comment I would like to make perhaps is that at this point in the book, I, I don't think it, we, we can really say anything about direct realism or any of these stances, because we are really going to the starting points of experience in a certain sense, trying to see how things are given to us in intuition. But later in the book, uh, in the chapter where he starts to deal with the structure of the human, he does make the point uh, of imminence, which is essentially saying that but whatever the case, the way the human is, he is caught in a certain sense in his consciousness. The way he perceives the world is as uh, contents of his uh, consciousness, which is kind of a reflection of um, uh, what we dealt with in the previous chapter, where we were, we were, we were looking at imminence as a consequence of the, uh, of the Cartesian dichotomy, but uh, also as he tries to derive the human uh, from, this basic, uh, from his basic definition, uh, understanding of life, comes to an, to an understanding that a human in the end is uh, has this condition of, of imminence of being uh, of being a certain, a certain sense a captive of his consciousness. 
So I th I think uh, that is that is kind of against against the strain is uh, the, the the direction of directorialism. I don't think he would he would uh, be quite satisfied with that. But he does also I think try to give um, a certain argumentation because the human is imminent because the human is distant from the things uh, from himself. He is able to start uh, treating things as objects which are out there and which seem he seems to be accessing in, accessing in a kind of direct way. Mm -hmm. So uh, by way of this uh, idea of imminence, which kind of closes the human in, um, in his own consciousness and by way of also uh, treating him as an eccentric being uh, in, a, in, a reflective, in a reflexive relation to himself, he does provide the ground for a kind of realism, but I, I don't think uh, calling it direct realism would be uh, quite con consistent with, with his uh, entire framework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jan. Um, I was, uh, the question I had in my mind when I was reading this chapter, and now it's also coming uh, on, on multiple, uh, multiple times, is does this description presuppose an observer? And Philip already mentioned that yes, perhaps, or uh, in what sense? In, in what sense? That's that's a question, and this is uh, uh, a question that is, uh, uh, if, if I put it from from different point of view, this is a, a question of a realism. Okay, so if this this description presupposes an observer, then it's not a realism. So for me, it's extremely important to ask already at this level whether this is realistic or not. He's using, uh, in the first part of, of this chapter, he's using many of the descriptions provided by Husserl. It's very Husserlian. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this is not a, Husserl wouldn't be a realistic description. It would be a transcendental, uh, let's say, uh, perhaps even transcendental idealistic description. And of course, he explicitly denounces this. He doesn't want to have this as a as an transcendental description. So he is using transcendental description, but in uh, under the, on the heading of a certain realism. So he is talking not about uh, phenomena and uh, uh, some core identities as they are presented to a consciousness, but of properties and substances. So he's using those descriptions, but he's making them, you know, shifting them in a, a realistic direction. And he's doing this very uh, kind of sneaky way. <laughs> So for me, it's 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 important to well, I I, um, I understand what Primoz uh, uh, pointed out, uh, uh, but I also uh, would like to kind of renew the the question about the observer. Uh, perhaps the observer is introduced in very in a silent way, and uh, for me, uh, well, the question I was asking myself, I I should be perhaps more uh, I should be aware of that. Um, and um, if if the observer is already involved in all these descriptions, then of course the question about uh, gestalts being in nature or being somewhat related to the observer, this this whole discussion changes changes completely. So you know the question about the physical gestalts, you know, of course there can be physical gestalts, but they are related to the observer, etc. So all the all the discussion is completely turned upside down if the observer is already there from the beginning. Yeah. So this is just to, to you know, uh, refresh all the questions or uh, some of them uh, from what has been said already. I hope it makes sense. Uh, I just throw throw on you everything. Yeah, Philip, you want yes, to- Yes, I, I found that a very helpful uh, discussion because I was seeing a lot, of, uh, particularly in a lot of that first part, something very, much a kind of Husserlian uh, uh, discussion of perception or uh, an intuition. But your point about where is the, does he presume an observer on this? Uh, I, I think that's a very interesting point to try to resolve in, in some ways, or is this simply being smuggled in in some particular way? It also could bear on the question then of his so-called realism or direct realism. Is, is he really holding something uh, of that kind or is he, or is there a certain holding back from the question that might uh, um, lead us in the direction of, of Husserl? But I, I think your point has been very good. Uh, 
in helping us to focus on that because I would like to see myself if there's more discussion of that later in the in the text as well. Good. Well, maybe one, one more point in relation to this uh, I, issue of direct realism. There's also in the chapter about the human, he's going to talk about the three uh, laws of anthropology, three anthropological laws. And one of the laws is the law of, um, <laughs> I have to translate from Slovene to, to English now, uh, I think it's uh, uh, mediated, what's the English mediated immediacy, immediate, yeah. So I think at, in, the, in this he basically may, takes a, quite a, a stance against a kind of direct realism. Everything the human always uh, has is given to him. It is always mediated to him. Even in animals, the world is in a certain sense mediated via the via their body. Um, so yeah, I, I think when we'll get to that part, uh, it'll be easier to make any keep any clear uh, judgments on that account. But um, in terms of whether there is an observer uh, presupposed, I would I would just say that he constantly emphasizes. That, uh, that all these things he's talking about, all these uh, objects which he's trying to analyze uh, into the uh, substantive core and the uh, p property, it is all given in intuition. And uh, it, I think it is inevitably someone's intuition. So I think he's, he's, he's always remi keeps reminding us that this is the phenomenon intuition, the, the only the object in intuition appears in this particular way. So he's not kind of trying to um, access some kind of reality behind that which is intuited at this point. This is something which is going to be enabled in actually only with a human, uh, with all the funky parts uh, of his consciousness. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the main things that he's trying to do here as well, whether he succeeds or not is a different question, but <clears throat> again, he's trying to find some sort of a via media so i have a that's why i have issues when for instance people are trying to say interpret merleau-ponty and also plesner as direct realist or something like that because in my view he is trying to escape precisely these types of categories so so to open up this you know middle ground where he would be able to talk how certain phenomena or realms or domains of being emerge when there is a certain meeting of of a specific say structure that we com call human and the the, the world and the uh, objects as as given to the human beings manifest themselves only in this particular encounter and living beings manifest themselves as the way they are in this particular encounter so it becomes in a certain sense almost meaningless in this picture, picture to, to inquire, you know, uh, whether there is a reality that is structured in this particular way out there, or whether there is a part of me that constitutes this particular reality in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's more of a back and forth, and it's a, it's a circle or a dance almost, out of which you somehow cannot, you know, escape somehow. So for him, for instance, the intuition, the intuitive part is not um, related to constitutive elements as they are in, say, the more um, transcendentalist tradition. Um, you would not find this, but he would still say that, you know, that the, the object has to appear in this particular sense. So it has to appear, but it doesn't necessarily have to appear to, a, say, a transcendental subject or a something like that, you know? And it's also not something that has to necessarily appear to something that is already fully constituted. So it's, it's a dynamism that has a very specific story. There's a, there's a genealogical story behind this that, that can be said. Not, I'm not saying that Plesner is necessarily saying it, but it could be said, you know? So that's, the, 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 that's at least how I am reading both Plesner and Merleau-Ponty with this regard, in this regard. So he, he is very, very clear that he does not want to be, does not want to side with idealists or tr transcendental idealists or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, he is realist in that regard. So he is not willing to take the transcendentalist step with Husserl. But 
is he a, 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 a direct realist? I don't think he is, at least, or at least you would really need to add a lot of qualifiers to that. He is a <laughs> direct realist if by this you understand this and this and this and this. And um, I think that you end up with a position that is very far removed from what people usually associate with direct realism. He is an indirect direct realist. <laughs> he is actually, yeah. Susanna, you were trying to say something or? Uh... No, no, no. I, I was also like thinking in that way because like I, I, I like my question also came like with this, um, this idea of contact theories, like this idea from Taylor and Dreyfus of uh, reviving uh, realism, retrieving realism. So like not thinking in these intermediaries in sense of like, for example, the body is an intermediary, but it's not intermediary, in, intermediary in the same sense that sense data or ideas are intermediary. It just presents us what is there, but it's like a contact with the world. Like what I was thinking about that in, in the sense of uh, realism, but I, I was not sure about this. If we like, if there's there are other options uh, apart from direct and indirect realism and how to frame that. But again, it's like breaking these dichotomies, right? Like it shouldn't like it's not like direct realism, not indirect realism, but then what it is. But like it's I I, I agree with me, like. I saw like idealism in the responses, also direct realism and indirect realism. So like um, in, uh, idealism in the sense of being from, from the subject side, but not like really transcendental idealism. So I was kind of confusing this <laughs> universe, but yeah, thank, thank you. Can I offer, a, I, I'm, I would like to share this with you. Uh, is that okay? Because, uh, it's sort of hard won, and I don't know if it's an accurate reading of Plesner, but it's um, an idea that I, I find very valuable. I'd like it to be a reading of Plesner. So um, is it possible that direct realism, something like direct realism, is really only possible indirectly? That, that direct realism is, or, or some kind of at world openness, as Shaler might call it, some kind of access to an objective world rather than merely an animal environment is only possible through a lot of mediation in the form of, for instance, self-criticism and revision and dialogue. And, you know, and, and I think there's a tradition in philosophy that has recognized mediacy as the means to a more thorough immediacy. And Hegel is the, you know, sort of the best example of it. But I would put Plesner, I mean, I want to read Plesner as in that tradition. Um, so it's, it's, it's not an either or. It's, it is indeed, as Primoz put it, um, he's an indirect direct realist. He's, you know, you get to direct realism through a lot of indirectness. Here, here's the thing. So this is precisely what I think that we really need to come up with new names and thematizations of these positions. Like I, I, I'm so frustrated when I see these, like that there's a slew of papers that, you know, just debate like endlessly, there are endless debates about, well, but is Merleau-Ponty really a realist or is he a transcendentalist? And it's such an easy way to score academic points, but it's basically futile, you know, it just muddies the water. I think that Merleau-Ponty would just, you know, give smacks to all these people <laughs> saying, stop it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So yeah, I, I find this idea interesting, but I think that it needs, it, it needs you know, a more proper thematization. I wanted to say also something, you know, um, this is a, a more uh, Uxculean take on, on the matter. Uh, I really like like this uh, one part of, um, Uxkul Strolls, so this Streifzüge book, uh, where he quotes Goethe, who says, um, were the eye not sun-like, it could never gaze upon the sun. So that, that's what 
Goethe said, right? But then Uxkul adds, were the sun not I like, it could not shine in any sky. So you see, you know, this is the idea, like this almost a dialogic, dialogical relationship that uh, Goethe tried to explicate Uxkul at certain times. And a lot of these, uh, particularly German thinkers at this point, were really somehow struggling to articulate. And then it, also some French thinkers as well, but uh, yeah. Anyway, any, any further thoughts or questions or comments? Philip, you had, you, you wrote something that you wrote in the chat that you had a certain topic that you would like to bring up and Dan, you also mentioned something, so. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to go in about 10 minutes. So maybe I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, just raise the well first of all that i've been following the rabbit hole that phil sloan suggested about the connection between gestalt and bert lamphy so he actually discussed <laughs> this uh cooler in uh, in his in his major organisms retreat forms of life in 1952 he actually credits cooler for introducing the system concept of the organism in psychology that's bert lamphy talking about cooler in 1949 and he also thinks that there is a, that general systems theory has a lot in common with psycho, with uh, Gestalt theory. But he says, Bert Lampy says, of course, as you would expect him, because he's, you know, given his personality, he says that uh, that it needs to be translated. So so anything that is said by the Gestalt psychologist for it to be truly truly fruitful has to be translated into the language of or, or systems theory with his own language, of course. But he is at the very least recognizing. Uh, Continuity. So you were right uh, uh, about uh, that suspicion of, of, of connection. So that's super interesting. Um, and then what I was just briefly going to, uh, what, what struck me was this uh, this characterization of mechanism, the mechanism vitalism dispute as being uh, committed to, well, the, the three assumptions and that the only, the third one is the one that uh, differs. It seems to me that not necessarily a, a universe, you know, a generalizable characterization of that dispute. I guess it works for his, for Plessner's own purposes, but it didn't seem to me to be obviously. No, that, that's only the classical way. So he would say, this is, you know, something that was pretty much present 18th, 19th century. And then people like Driesch and Kühler moved the discussion right. away from this. So basically, yeah. you know, the, the, the physicalist or the mechanicist was now able to actually use concepts such as Gestalt to, to, to defend their own position. They, they didn't have to to revert to the notion of the machine as construed in the yeah no I think that's I think that's fair enough yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. The idea is, is seems right to me that, he could that, he uh, could uh, I would I would you know maybe uh, go back to the point that you mentioned I think uh, during our first discussion he could probably refer to a lot of other people here as well but I think that he's basically using Driesch and um, Köhler just to to make a point you know just to kind of bring home the, some of the changes that have uh, uh, arisen or taken place in this time. And um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, so, well, I mean, it's just for example, that the second, so the, the three assumptions are the first one, understanding natural phenomena means explaining, explaining them causally, fine. The second one, the scientific explanation of biological phenomena aims at tracing them back to chemical and physical relationships and their laws which are ultimately model on the mechanical relations between isolated particles. This, this is the old school a view. Bit, a little bit less. This inventive. is the old school view, yeah. This is, this is say, prior, the prior killer and people like that who haven't okay. uh, reconceptualized the notion of mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. after that, you know, you don't necessarily have to buy this. But, this but, but if this is a premise that is shared by the vitalist as well. No, 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 no. This is just the premise that, that was shared before these new discussions start. So this is, this is how the, the, the whole discussion was framed traditionally, traditionally. But then I, now, okay. you know, the, 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 the debate has changed. The, the, yeah, the I know. I understood. Okay. But I just understood when he said there are three, these three assumptions and whether one is a mechanism and a vitalist is depending mm -hmm. on the third one. I assume that to, to mean that the second assumption mm -hmm. is shared, mm -hmm. but it's not. This right? is precisely the, 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 that's precisely why, for example, you know, Kuller's contribution muddies the water so much because he basically changes the notion of mechanism and the second premise no, no longer holds. 
So he kind of changes the whole debate. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, the, 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 you'll have people, C.D. Broad famously writing in the 1920s uh, in the, and also 1910s trying to um, in mind that it's, it's place in nature and also uh, this uh, the scientific method. I think it's the other book, big chunky books, you know, as someone who actually, I think you could call a philosopher of science uh even though he doesn't belong to the traditions that led to the prof professionalization of the discipline if you want to take that um as an important consideration he's already talking about different meanings of mechanism right and how mechanism doesn't just mean an appeal to it can mean lots of things it can mean it can mean scientific mechanism explanation explanation in terms of causes it can mean something more specific as a commitment to a sort of a machine view of life uh but it can just and and you know in a very restricted form it can be and, a, and a, an explanation in terms of classical mechanics, which is, you know, very difficult to suggest that that such an explanation from the 17th century could do justice to even the mechanists, right, who are trying to make sense of of, uh, of biological systems. But, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, that you already have the idea of mechanism as as being essentially a word for physical chemical explanation in others before before uh, Kohler. And uh, 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 what I like though about the Gestalt. Uh, idea is that it, it tries to, to, to offer an olive branch, as it were, to get closer, right, to, to try to make sense of wholeness uh, in its own physicalist way. And I think that's really, really cool. Although, again, if you look at Loeb, Loeb actually has a book called The Organism as a Whole, who he, that he wrote to try to respond to the vitalist attack. So the history is always more complicated than that, and uh, you always find, um, but um, yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention is, is uh, you always have this, this tension on the one hand, so if you want to talk about the distinctiveness of life, and I guess Plesner wants to in some sense, right, um, you, you obviously have to recognize that life, the living systems are physical systems, so you, there's always going to be this tension of how much do you allow that to bear on your, on, on, on your characterization of what makes organisms or the living different, right, because you, you can't deny that there are physical systems. So you always walk in this very fine line of saying, okay, yes, 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 but there's something more. How do you define the more, right? Uh, that's a problem for, I mean, the organicists try to resolve that by talking about organization, but then they're criticized for being obscure by what organization means. This is why the second wave organizers you know, differ from the first wave. Uh, Needham talks about um, John Scott Haldane as a, what he calls it, a dogmatic or obscurantist organicist. What does that mean? It means that, He's got, you know, his heart is in the right place, uh, but he's dogmatic about it, right? Organiz organization is going to help. It's going to maybe save or resolve the dispute, but you can't just appeal to organization as if it was some sort of rabbit out of a box in a magic trick. You need to explain what it is and, and what and how we make sense of it. And so you've got all these other organizations, you know, Bert Lamphy, Woodger saying, organization cannot be the, um, the explanance. It has to be the explanandum. Right, we have to try to work out what it is instead of just saying that we can, we can, you know, tap ourselves on the back when we say, oh, well, you know, it's organization that makes the difference. We're done. Let's go and have lunch. We're finished with this discussion, right? So, so the, the concern with organization as a problem in its own right is what is what I think characterizes the organicist's um, work from, I would say, about 1925 or so onwards, right? Um, again, that doesn't say, and of course you can trace Maturana and Varela and all of that stuff back to that, because these are all, they are already talking about organization. So Maturana and Varela either can't be considered to have like developed something from scratch in that sense, because the, the concern with organization is one that you find already in the 20s and 30s. I know that because, I mean, I wanted to mention that because I noticed, Seb, that you're really into, you're reading Varela very carefully now, and I see that you're reporting your, uh, your analyses of, of his work, so I just figured, it's important to also recognize the notion of autonomy, again, is one that comes up much earlier, 50 years earlier. Um, so there's nothing new in that either, of course. Uh, uh, so no, uh, just, just, just maybe, I don't know if anyone else has any comments on this, right? That you have, you want to recognize the physicality of what you're describing. Uh, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you want to deny that, right? But, on, at, but at the same time, how you talk about the more, the thing that is added is, is the difficult thing. And I guess the, the really cool thing about Plesner is that he's, yeah, he's just talking about this distinction right between the internal and the external as a way of making sense of that and how that brings the subject into the discussion in a way that is not at all the way you find in the other, the, you know, in, in the other discourse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is extremely helpful, like these, uh, the points that you're making. Yeah, and I hope that 
this is precisely that will be what we'll be able to do <laughs> to unravel Lesnar's position <laughs> as clearly as possible. Um, yeah, a, a, a lot of ground to co cover in, in, in the next few discussions. Yeah, and just to answer the, the question that Philip is, is asking, so about whether the organisms refer mm -hmm. favorably to Kohler. So I think uh, Phil Sloan is right in that it's a, a kind of a complicated, uh, it's a really good question because it's not the answer is not obvious, right? So at least Bernd Laffey, I'm just, I've just checked his works, seems to want to say that he wants to recognize Kohler as some sort of uh, uh, an ally in wanting to bring to, basically in wanting to, uh, to, to explain certain biological features by appealing to principles that exist in a non-living world. Okay, because that's a way of of making it legitimate, of naturalizing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think it's, I'm guessing it's probably a question that requires a little bit of historical grunt work to answer. I mean, like, what about Needham? What about Woodger? What about, you know, the, I know you've, you kind of, and your publications have kind of shown us about a lot and other, others have shown us about a, a you know, a dozen or so figures in that camp. And I just wonder what did they generally say about Kohler? Would they generally say the same thing as Bertolanfi or a variety of different things? Do they take issue with Kohler? Does he not make enough of a distinction between the living and the non-living for them? You know, so I don't know. I think that's an open yeah. question to be answered. And also, in the what's really interesting, Dan mentioned that uh, Bertolanfi uh, is referring to Kohler as someone who introduced the notion of the whole into the into the psychological discourse. But That's basically he wrote that particular book on physical gestalt, like it's a whole darn book uh, where he talks about these physical examples. Uh, and I, I just wonder, you know, if he's also referring to that maybe in some other book. Yeah, there's a, there's, I noticed there's a footnote where he, where he also says, oh, well, by the way, Kohler also discussed examples that refer to biology, <laughs> but it's mostly on, psycho, on the psychological side. I, that, and, but I think Philip uh, Hollenberg is totally right, right? We should probably look at what all the other authors were making. By but the, the way, reason that, why I was- there's also, there's also a book um, by Kovka, also a really thick tome, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, I'll, I'll check the, the title, I forgot it, but it's, it, he also basically in that particular book, uh, it's a book that um, Merleau-Ponty mostly refers to when he's critiquing this physicalist conception uh, in, in Gestalt psychologists. Uh, and, and he's basically defending, defending a similar position to, to the one propounded by Kohler. So the same idea, you know, you can already find Gestalt in the physical realm, ergo you can in a certain sense, at least in yeah. principle, reduce all the gestalt and biological and conscious and or well, mental. Yeah. To, to the so physical. the in the in the, in this in the 1952 uh, Problems of Life book, he when he's talking about Kohler's work uh, in the 20s, he says it, he talks about it as an unrealized, but as a, an idea with unrealized potential. <laughs> okay. So he's writing 25 years later, saying, "Well, it was a good idea. It didn't seem to." fly or uh, let me, let me uh, just I, check the book uh, and also i was so very very excited to see it being mentioned in this book that i sent you the pdf of right where that book is from 1930s trying to provide a survey of different points of view or different accounts of life and there Kohler and the gestalton is discussed with one particular chapter uh, uh, entitled what uh, you know new new a new defense for mechanism right so and that's so according to this author mcdougall it looks like the gestalt idea provide support not for the uh, you know for, for the for the mechanistic side um, so yeah it's, it's a complicated it's a really complicated question of where to situate this stuff mm -hmm. so the book is called the principles of gestalt psychology and it's a really thick one okay uh, but it's an interesting read uh, and yeah it's also interesting because uh, Kovka covers a lot of ground and he uh, as I've mentioned he's one of the three uh, founding figure, so to speak, uh, of the of Gestalt Berlin school, so to speak, the the the, the main uh, the mastermind between the movement was Wertheimer, who was, in my view, uh, by far the most uh, ingenious and uh, like philosophically mo most sophisticated. Sophisticated, unfortunately, um, his uh, work is just you know all over. He, he's published a lot of articles, not particularly well known, but he had really interesting lectures on Gestalt philosophy, not just psychology, but philosophy. He was most philosophically minded of the three. 
Uh, mm-hmm. So um, I have a book on him. I haven't read it yet. I think it was written by his son. Um, so yeah, th- this book by Kof- Kofka is also extremely interesting. And Gestalt psychologists in general, they're very like they're um, unfairly overlooked. Uh, there's a lot of wealth in, in their work, but often, you know, they are treated either summarily or completely ignored. So uh, not a lot of people are familiar with their, uh, with their works. So is it, fair, is, it, is it fair to, is Matt Lamphy fair uh, when he says that it's, it remained an idea with, that hadn't been properly realized? Oh, I, I would say that th- there is some truth to it. And I, I think that unfortunately, the reason for this is um, uh, um, the, the reasons for this are socio political in nature. So the Second World War and basically Gestalt program falling apart on a very concrete level, people moving to different parts, yeah. uh, losing contact with one another, finding themselves in a new in a new milieu that was not particularly susceptible to these ideas. This is also, for instance, I, I'm reading now uh, um, uh, an edited volume that is dedicated to Kurt Goldstein. And this is, this is the experience that Kurt Goldstein had when he moved to the States. He said that he loved working in the States and there were so many brilliant people around him, but there were just people he could not, um, he could not find ways very often to translate some of the ideas that he was developing or that, that he found you know, just most intriguing. Because, because this overall framework that we were talking about that we're constantly mentioning was simply not there. You know, when he came over and there were, you know, uh, American psychologists w- who were well-versed in, in particularly empiricist tradition in, in many of its guises, they just didn't get the, the whole Gestalt, Kantian, Goethean, whatever. You know, they, 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 they did their best and he had quite a lot of people who were very enthusiastic about what he was doing and they, they would consider themselves to be his followers. But he said that he had such grave problems, you know, finding uh, people that he could discuss with and also the very pragmatic stuff. Although he, he could clear, he, he, he clearly mastered the English language, language he, he, he would often complain that it never came naturally, natural to him. So it was never natural for him. So there are all these factors usually, you know, involved in, in, in these uh, happenings. We, we just focus on ideas, but then we forget that, you know, something like Ukraine happens and all of a sudden something very concrete manifests itself where you simply have to move somewhere in very dire conditions and end up somewhere that even if you have the, the, the conditions that you can work, you know, that the climate has changed. You're like a, a plant in a, in a completely new <laughs> climate. <laughs> yeah, that's what the, why the new school was so much a haven for so many of these people when they came to the United States. And uh, uh, Plessner, I think, was there for a period of time and he became a good friend of uh, Gervich. And, uh, mm. uh, but, but again, it's, if, if it weren't for some, colonies like that, this sort of thing would never have been introduced. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That was great. Thanks, guys. I also have to leave. Um, enjoy the rest of your discussion and see you next yeah, time. I'm going to have to go too. Thank you. Cheers, Dan. Yep. Right. I guess I'll, I'll say goodbye as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm leaving as well. Have a good one. Uh-huh. So maybe we can just, you know, call it a meeting. <laughs> uh, okay, Dan, be well. See you next time. Maybe Bye-bye. Sebastian, can I can I have a five minute with you? Yeah, for sure.